I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Dave. And let me just start by thanking everybody uh, for gathering uh, today uh, in support of our, our friend, uh, Tom Hucker, who's been just a, a great fighter for working people and other really important causes uh, in Montgomery County and across uh, the state of Maryland. And as Dave just mentioned, uh, our council members are right now uh, hard at work overtime uh, on a meeting. Um, and I'm out in my car right now um, outside the Capitol. And the reason I'm here is uh, we have a series of votes that may take us um, up to around 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning uh, on the budget resolution process, uh, which you may be reading about. Uh, we are determined uh, to pass another round of very badly needed um, emergency relief, uh, both to uh, defeat the virus, uh, make sure that we uh, produce more vaccine and distribute it more quickly and effectively, uh, that we provide continued masks um, and PPE, uh, and that we help people who are hurting. A lot of the assistance in the bipartisan bill that passed in December uh, will expire uh, in mid-March, but it's pretty clear uh, we're gonna be paddle battling this pandemic for some time. So that's why President Biden uh, put forward his American Rescue Plan. Um, it meets the moment, it's what we need. Uh, we would like to have Republican senators uh, join us um, and we're happy to take ideas, but we need to make sure that the overall impact uh, of this bill uh, on the economy and on defeating the virus uh, remains intact. And that's our overriding priority. So as you probably heard, we're, we're double tracking the process. We're continuing uh, discussions uh, with Republican senators, uh, but we need an insurance plan. Uh, we need to make sure at the end of the day, uh, meaningful relief passes. And that's what this process that we're up to right now is all about. It's uh, the first step in what's called the budget reconciliation process, uh, whereby if you have proposals that directly relate to the economy and the budget, uh, you can set up a process that ultimately allows you to pass it by 51 votes in the Senate and avoid a filibuster, uh, which would allow Republicans uh, to block reform. So that's what we're doing right now. And it's an important you know, compliment to what's happening in Montgomery County and Tom Hucker's efforts uh, to make sure that at the county level and at the state of Maryland level, uh, there's also uh, meaningful relief to, to defeat the virus uh, and to make sure that uh, those who are most in need uh, get the help uh, necessary because we've seen this pandemic um, have a disproportionate impact on working families, on communities of color, uh, and it has really shown a harsh light on so many disparities uh, in our society, in our economy. Uh, and we need to be working hard at all levels of government uh, to address that, uh, which is why I wanna salute Tom for his leadership and his colleagues on the council uh, for doing everything that they can, uh, but they also need a partner at the state of Maryland. And that's why you know, Tom really brought together a coalition of individuals and organizations and elected officials uh, to call upon the governor to have a strong state response uh, and call for a strong state uh, stimulus. Um, and while uh, there was a lot of delay uh, from the governor, ultimately, I think the day after we all held our second rally, uh, the governor put forward a proposal, uh, which was certainly better than uh, where we had been in the state, but I think all of us recognize that just as we need to do more at the federal level, uh, we need to do more at the state level uh, in terms of uh, the relief package. And I know that uh, both the state House of Delegates and the state Senate are working on that. And uh, I just wanna thank and salute Tom Hucker for all his efforts in pushing uh, to have more funds released from the state rainy day account. I mean, if a global pandemic uh, is not a, a super stormy rainy day, I don't know what is. And it makes no sense uh, to not provide for people who are in desperate need. We've all seen the food lines. We've seen people uh, really under incredible financial stress. Uh, we've seen the toll in terms of mental health um, and substance uh, use disorder. So this is a full-scale emergency and it needs to be treated like that. 
uh, at the federal, state, and local level. And Tom has been at the forefront of that effort. Uh, and he's been at the forefront, of course, of the effort uh, to try to make sure that the vaccines are distributed uh, in an effective and efficient and fair way. Uh, and the Maryland congressional delegation, at least um, Senator Cardin and myself and seven of the eight members of the congressional delegation just wrote uh, to Governor Hogan the other day, because if you look at the CDC figures, the Center for Disease Control figures, they show that Maryland has been really at the back of the pack uh, in terms of distributing the vaccine it has uh, to the people in Maryland, actually getting the vaccine into people's arms. Um, for a while, we were dead last. We were 50 out of 50. Uh, then we improved, but still were uh, like 41. Now we're, you know, 37 or so, but we are still way at the back of the pack. Uh, Maryland needs to be uh, at, the, at the front of this effort uh, and certainly not a laggard uh, in this effort. So we're calling for more transparency, for more uh, accessible uh, ways to schedule people's uh, vaccines and more clarity on who's eligible and where they go. Uh, because even in Montgomery County, as you know, depending on whether it's the county health department or the hospital or a pharmacy, uh, different rules apply and there's just unnecessary uh, confusion here. So uh, we, are, we are working at the federal level to increase the supply, but it's important that the state uh, have a more streamlined system. And I know Tom has been working uh, with others in the county for that. So whether it's vaccine distribution or getting important support to people who need it most, uh, I just want to thank Tom for uh, his leadership efforts. Uh, and that's just what he's been doing in the last three weeks. Uh, he has a very long and distinguished record of fighting uh, for other very important causes, uh, whether it be on the environment and protection, um, on transportation, um, education, uh, consumer rights. Uh, so uh, thank you, Tom Hucker, and thank, thank all you. of you for coming together to support him. Thank you so much, Ron. Senator. I really appreciate um, your availability and your, your remarks. I know you've got to run, really grateful. You should run whenever you need to, but I'm really grateful to you and, and Samantha as well for helping get you here today, uh, despite your really busy schedule during the pandemic. Um, well, it's great to be here. I don't know if uh, Dave said, I, I mean, we haven't called the vote yet, but if, if you want to do a couple questions now, I'm available, uh, please. but otherwise, uh, whatever whatever you want. Great, no, let's do it. Uh, you, while you're here, does anybody have questions for Senator Van Hollen? Yes, I do. Yeah. This is Larry Edmonds. How you doing, Tom? Hey, Larry, go ahead. Hey, Larry. Yeah, Chris, how you doing? Good to see you. Good, you too. We talked about it last night at our uh, East County Advisory Board uh, meeting, and we were discussing, of course, the vaccines and how they're getting out, and we're having a lot of issues with a lot of the seniors and, of course, the less fortunate members in the community being able to have the time element to be able to get out to actually take the vaccines. And what we were wondering is, we know that we're supposed to be coming out with this new vaccine with 100 million doses coming out, and we've already had some areas in the state where they're saying that they're going to do mass vaccinations. We were looking at, you know, Montgomery County, a pretty big county right outside the, the district. And we were wondering, you know, is there a way that we're going to be able to get in line with that, have a set up central location maybe in Montgomery County? You know, the, the, I've already thought about a lot of ways we could do this. Uh, you know, the fairgrounds, anywhere where it's a large capacity areas, uh, to be able to maybe even have a way to get citizens that can't get to the vaccinations and be able to pick them up, deliver them to the vaccinations, bring them back and have them, you know, processes like that where we can get people to the vaccinations, you know, instead of them having to wait to get vaccinated. Right, yeah, so this is, we wanna do, the state is now talking about uh, setting up more vax, you know, mass vaccination centers. Um, so is uh, President uh, Biden um, and also bringing in more, you know, federal public health officials and getting FEMA. We really need to up our, our game in terms of the healthcare uh, workforce. I mean, we're gonna be doing this for months um, and we have to, unfortunately the last administration, um, you know, did not set in place any structure uh, to really uh, provide for the distribution. I mean, that was an afterthought. I mean, the good news is that we um, have a, a vaccine, uh, but uh, we need to number one, produce more of it and then distribute it uh, more quickly. So I, I support these mass vaccination efforts. 
It is really important though that they be coordinated um, with you know, the county health department and, and others because the county, for example, has set up, as you know, uh, various distribution centers. So the, the, the problem we've been having is total lack of transparency and coordination here. If you, you know, go to the county health system, you have to be over 75, at least it was. But if you go to the, the, you know, the giant or to the hospital, uh, if you're in another group, you're eligible. The, the thing we need to do is just make sure that people have some certainty as to when they will be able to get the vaccine so that they can find a place easily, schedule it, you know, and have the certainty and peace of mind that they know when it will be. Um, so I, I'm, in addition to having mass vaccination centers, which are important, this transparency and coordination is really important. And now I am being told uh, that I've got to run or I will miss a vote uh, on the reconciliation. Th thank you all, Tom, thank you for your leadership and thank all of you for supporting Tom and his leadership. Oh, Take thank care. Thank you so much for being here, Senator. I really appreciate your support. Good, good to be Bye. here, thanks. Bye-bye. Um, I, I believe our next speaker uh, would be council member uh, Sydney Katz. Uh, Sydney, are you still there? Uh, Sydney was here. Well, we can uh, we can come back to him. Um, he might have some technical difficulties. Um, Councilmember Navarro, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, right. everybody. Uh, so um, it's great to see your faces. We uh, have been uh, crazy, of course, with just a lot going on. But I did not want to miss the opportunity to to speak to you and to express my incredible support for our council president, my friend Tom, uh, as he leads our council uh, during this very, very difficult time. And uh, I have to say, you know, council member Katz did an extraordinary job last year uh, leading us uh, through this unprecedented uh, time. And there is no doubt that even though none of us imagined that we would be facing this in 2021, here we are, and I am so pleased that we have Tom leading us. There's no doubt that for us right now, the number one issue uh, on our agenda continues to be this, this, this notion of, of now the vaccines. And I know, Larry, the question that you asked, believe you me, we've been uh, already asking those questions about sites for mass va vaccinations, and we have an amazing team with Dr. Gilson Stoddard, and Tom has been making sure that as we have these briefings, that all of these questions are, are going through. We're also having to deal with fiscal issues. And, you know, Tom is somebody that understands not only what happens in Annapolis, but also locally. Um, and this is front and center for us as well. But more than anything, it's just about how are we gonna recover and how are we gonna move forward? And so I just wanted to be here to say, you know, to say thank you to Tom, but to also thank all of you because we have not, we would not be where we are in terms of the pandemic and, and really dealing with the cases, et cetera, if it wasn't because of our extraordinary uh, constituents who are always there to step up and make sure that we follow all of the safety guidelines. This has been important for us. Uh, and so, um, you know, Tom, we will continue to support you and, uh, and we'll continue to work with you. Uh, and so thank you, everybody. I hate to hop off because of course we do have a public hearing going on, but I wanna make sure that we also get dinner before we do that for the fam for my family. So thank you, everyone. It's great to see all your faces. Thank you so much, Councilmember Navarro. Very, very grateful for your presence. Thank you and your support. Dave? Uh, yes, uh, is Councilmember uh, Katz, have, have you been able to join? I don't, um, I don't see him. Uh, so I, um, we're uh, very excited to uh, hear, uh, hear from you, Tom, and, and take some questions. Thanks, Dave. I'm sure Dave's excited. He's with me all day long. Um, he's not, uh, trust me, he's not excited to hear more from me. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all so much uh, for being here tonight. It, uh, uh, it means a lot to have your continued support. I'm really grateful. It's nice to see so many friends here 
um, and your on your thumbnails. Um, and Samantha, thanks so much to you and Senator Van Hollen for being here. You got a lot going on, and for you to make time uh, to be here and support me really means a lot. I really I'm really grateful for Chris's long term participation partnership and uh, for, you know, we're all grateful. I think everybody on this call, all Marylanders are really grateful for his leadership in such difficult times. We see him on the news, uh, you know, every night and he's always just fabulous. And I met him when he was, I think the state Senator from 18 and, you know, he's been such a consistent leader on everything he said, education, pre-K, transportation, the environment, one issue after another that everybody in Montgomery County really cares about. So we're really grateful for that. Um, and I'm very grateful to the, for the support of my colleagues, Council Member Navarro and Katz. Um, and sorry to be a little bit late. We just wrapped up a closed session dealing with the hazard pay for our employees. So that was, uh, what do you know? People had a lot of opinions about that and it went a little bit long. So I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Um, but I'm really grateful to, uh, to Nancy and Sydney for their support. They're both the two most recent council presidents. So uh, they're not only good friends, I really rely on them for advice in this new role I have, uh, which keeps me very busy. And we have nine colleagues with very strong opinions um, that um, uh, it's not like Annapolis. They're not just waiting around to see what the council president thinks. So um, I, I, uh, it's really nice to have two uh, very competent previous council presidents uh, only a phone call away uh, as I'm, I'm wrestling with a lot of the difficult issues in front of us. Um, <clears throat> let me thank my staff, Dave Kuhns, who's on here as well, and Julio Murillo and uh, Michael Solomon and others who, who put this together. Um, so I, I want to share just some updates about our priorities. And I don't know, Dave, if you have uh, the slides that Dave was working on. Don't be disappointed if this doesn't work. But um, I want to share some some. Uh, updates with you all about the priorities we're dealing with in, during this really uh, unprecedented, very difficult time. As you know, we've been in this pandemic for, for almost a year now, really. It started last, last March, right? And at the moment, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but there's a huge amount of work we have to do to get through what are still the worst months that may be ahead of us. Um, this February and January have been two of the worst months during this whole period. Um, and we have so much work to do to ensure an equitable recovery and to bring our economy back um, the right way. The council has a huge task this year to manage our existing duties and to do all this additional work to manage what is the worst health crisis uh, since the Great Depression and the worst, um, the worst health crisis since the Spanish flu of 1918. Some of you might remember that. And the worst uh, economic crisis since the Great Depression. At least Jonathan smiled, that's good. Um, so I want to I want to run you through three priorities. Um, but um, the the first one is sorry, Dave. I have to keep exiting the full screen so I can um, see what I'm talking about. The highest priority for number for uh, 2021 is executing a strategy to get the vaccines in everybody's arm. Um, I know this is on all of your minds. Some of you have probably been vaccinated. Most of you haven't. We're all working really around the clock to try to get vaccines in arms in Maryland and Montgomery County as quickly as possible. But it's really difficult. Um, and I'll, I'll talk in a minute just about some of the, uh, the struggles that we're dealing with both the federal level and the state level. The second one is um, we, can't, we can't fight these twin crises um, alone, just as Montgomery County. We've received a significant amount of support from the federal government, and we're really looking forward to more. Um, we have not received very much support at all from the state government. And that's why I've helped organize the coalition that Senator Van Hollen was talking about. I'll tell you more about that. But if we don't get every dollar we can from the state and federal government, and if we don't provide proper oversight to manage, to make sure we're spending it in the right places in Montgomery County, we're really blowing this opportunity to respond to this crisis. And the third priority is to manage the change. We had priorities before COVID just showed up on our doorstep in March, right? We, um, Councilmember Navarro was the leader at passing a racial equity and social justice um, commitment uh, from Montgomery County that requires us to look at our historic inequities and look at every single piece of legislation and every budget decision we make through a racial equity and social justice lens. That's not only really important, it's hard. And we've hired staff to do that. And we now are providing a racial equity uh, assessment to all council members on every piece of legislation. So we have more to read, but that's a good thing because it's, make, it's forcing us to have analysis and look at issues in a new way um, to correct the historic inequities 
that have you know, beleaguered our county and really the whole nation. Um, but we had that priority. We had a, a priority tackling climate change. We had a housing crisis in front of us. We're trying to deal with many of those um, policy priorities that were well established before COVID while we're dealing with this health crisis and this, uh, this historic recession. So in terms of COVID vaccines, that's priority number one. The most impactful thing we can do is to ensure everybody gets vaccinated. That's essential to protect all of our health and safety going forward. I think you all know the state of Maryland relies on the federal supply of vaccines. And Maryland's 24 jurisdictions rely on a weekly supply of vaccines from the state. Now, Montgomery County, I'm, I want to reassure you, is number one in the state at efficiently getting every vaccine that we receive into people's arms. That's our job. And yet the state supply that we get from Annapolis has uh, not kept up with our significant population and our role as the largest county. We're the most populous jurisdiction in the state. We're only getting about 10,000 vaccines a week or less. Last week was 5,500. That's not to say the state isn't giving to our six Montgomery hospitals as well, but as Senator Van Hollen said, it's very, because we have this uneven rollout, it's very even and conf uneven and confusing for people to have to figure out how do I get vaccinated at uh, a, health, a county health center? And if I am not eligible yet, do I need to sign up at CVS? Do I need to sign up at Giant? Do I need to sign up somewhere else? That's very confusing and our inboxes are blowing up with, concern, with questions legitimate questions people have on their minds about how to manage this. Second, it's just not Montgomery County that's not getting enough vaccines. It's all the large counties. Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County are all getting between 1.6 and 1.7 and 2.6 doses per 100 residents, while the smaller counties, Talbot, Calvert, Charles, are all getting around eight vaccines per 100 people, four times what we're getting. That doesn't make sense. It's inequitable. We have been consistently advocating to the state to give us more vaccines and trying to hold the state accountable. We held a um, town hall meeting two weeks ago. 2,500 people signed up for it. We invited the Secretary of Health to answer questions about the rollout. He didn't show up, nor did he send any of his 3,000 staff to answer questions from Montgomery County. We're holding another oversight hearing next Tuesday so we can find out about nursing homes. Many of you have relatives in nursing homes you're concerned about. We have no authority over nursing homes. The state has 100% authority over nursing homes. People have lots of concerns. There's been lots in the on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, so I'm glad that they're finally gonna show up and answer our questions about nursing homes on Tuesday. So I hope you'll tune in for that. Um, but that increasing the collaboration and the transparency with the state is really, really critical as we move forward to get vaccine, all the vaccines we deserve and to, you know, I rest assured, we'll get those into arms very efficiently if they would just give them to us in Montgomery County. Um, and hopefully the state will be getting a lot more vaccines soon from the federal government. You've seen Joe, uh, President Biden um, order 200 vaccines um, from the manufacturers and set a goal of getting 100 million vaccines out into the public in the first 100 days. That's really ambitious and really welcome after the dysfunctional Trump administration. Second goal, we wanna fight for more resources. Senator Van Hollen mentioned the, um, the coalition that I've helped put together at the state level to fight uh, um, for more resources from the state government. We're in, as I mentioned, the worst pandemic and recession in 100 years. There's no reason that the state has $900 million in a rainy day fund that was designed to mitigate the effects of a recession like this. And they have $585 million in surplus from last year. So that's a billion and a half dollars they're sitting on when they should be getting that into the pockets of suffering families that are, we have 250,000 that are 300 million behind on their rent and that are facing eviction. We have 30,000 businesses that have already gone under and one out of four that say they might go under in the next six months there's no reason for all that, all those funds that are our tax funds gathering dust in Annapolis when they could be on Main Street to relieve the suffering of, of our working families and to keep our small businesses afloat. Um, that's not only the humane thing to do, it's the fiscally responsible thing to do because every business that goes under means less tax revenue, Kerry Corpy, for the state going forward, right? So that's why I put together this coalition. You can see some of the individuals on the flyer there. Senator Van Hollen spoke on January 10th at our rally. I had the, the council presidents of Prince George's County, Howard County, um, Montgomery County, um, uh, who am I forgetting, Anne Arundel, Baltimore County, 
all joining us at these two events, along with nonprofit providers, NAACP, CASA, other, the teachers union, AFSME, um, all pushing the governor to release these rainy day funds. And it worked. As, as uh, uh, Chris said, 20 minutes after we closed our event on January 10th, the governor sent out a news advisory on a Sunday saying he was going to release an, a relief package the next day. And he did. Unfortunately, it's a lot of tax cuts and not a lot of cash you can spend in the grocery store or to pay your rent. So I'm glad he did that. The Senate has now improved on that. And the Senate it passed the Senate floor literally yesterday. And it's over to the House now. And I've talked to a lot of House leaders. They're going to make it much um, better over there. And we're going to see, I believe, $1,000 checks or more in the pockets of working families all across Maryland um, and a lot of relief on rental assistance, utility relief, other things like that, because we've put together this coalition to demand relief from Annapolis. Um, and third, I want to talk about the agenda beyond the pandemic. As I mentioned, we have an ambitious climate action plan, which will be a roadmap to reach our, cl our county's climate goals. We have goals of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2027, 100% by 2035. That's very difficult. And I'm in constant communication with the executive branch and their staff. They're bringing over what will be pretty controversial bills to reduce the carbon <laughs> emissions from our buildings, which are two thirds of our emission, and our transportation as well, um, which are about one third. We also have this big housing crisis. It's been ratified by the Greater Washington Council of Governments. I serve on their board. Fairfax, Montgomery, Prince George's, DC, all the big jurisdictions have accepted the fact that we have a huge housing crisis. We're not building units nearly enough for the demand because we have such a desirable metro area. And we've adopted a goal of building 10,000 new units every year for 10 years. That's hard to do too, but it's necessary. So we're moving ahead with that and reaching our climate goals while we're dealing with this pandemic. And at the same time, we're trying to improve our transportation systems. We stood up the first bus rapid transit in the state uh, entirely in my district from Burtonsville to Silver Spring. If you've been on Route 29, you see the flash buses, these extra long reticulated buses driving um, from Burtonsville to Silver Spring. That provides a high quality transit product for the most underserved area of the county, an area that has three times the unemployment rate of the rest of the county before the COVID recession hit. So it's, it's, a, it's a big, we had a big IOU to that area of the county that I represent. And I'm thrilled that we were able to deliver a flash bus to them to get them quickly from Burtonsville and White Oak and the residential communities up there to job centers in Silver Spring and on the red line. And we've also stood up the first electric buses in Montgomery County. We have many more on order. They're running in my district right now and they're gonna be expanding across the, the county um, in the next couple of years. Um, we're also upholding our commitment to our teachers and students by ensuring continuity of funding for education and advocating for the Kerwin um, bill to be overridden, the governor's veto to be overridden in Annapolis and doing a lot of work to keep our tenants and our homeowners safe. You all remember the explosion down the street from me here, five blocks away in Flower Branch, Scott Schneider's neighborhood. Um, four years ago, the federal government said it was due to these faulty gas regulators. I now have a bill to require every, well, the, the bad news is there's hundreds of those in units all across the area. I have a bill to replace them within 60 days and another bill um, to keep our tenants safe because we we've had three toddlers in a year fall out of apartment windows and either perish or suffer significant injuries. So I have a bill to make us like New York City and require landlords to put in window guards to keep all our children safe. So 2020, there's a lot going on if you can't tell. It's been very difficult, um, but I really see 2021 as our chance, like Joe Biden says, to build back better. And our view of that in Montgomery County is we have a real chance to meet our climate goals, meet our housing goals, meet our racial equity goals, and build back a society in a county that's stronger, healthier, more equitable, more sustainable, and more prosperous as the economy reopens in 2021. I am so proud and humbled to have your support. I'm really grateful um, to have so many um, friends of many, many years on the call here and new friends as well. And with your help, as, as Nancy said, we don't get this done on our own in Montgomery County. We do it because we have such an informed and active uh, set of supporters all across the county. And uh, we're looking forward to working closely with you and we need all your best ideas and your involvement to reach all the goals I mentioned. Thank you so much again. Let me stop there and see if anybody has any questions. 
Yeah, this is Bob Loeb. I have a question. Hi, Bob. I was wondering, we have a um, kilowatt tax on our um, uh, energy bills from Montgomery County. And I was wondering if we could turn it, it you know, from a straight kilowatt tax into say a carbon tax, where if you buy from a um, wind energy, the tax goes down. But if you buy from a reseller who has a lot of fossil fuel in the mix, the tax would go up as a way to help uh, deal with it. Broccoli. Oh. To have a two-tier tax, essentially, the right. energy tax. Okay, Bob, that's an interesting idea. I I I like that idea. I haven't heard that proposal before, and so let me uh, let me look into it. Um, um, that that's a very good one. I've actually drafted some legislation that we haven't introduced yet to try to dedicate, and there's it's complicated, but it's trying to, to dedicate those funds that are raised through the energy tax to energy efficiency improvements. Um, to make our buildings um, and our transportation more efficient and you know more carbon neutral, um, but I like your idea as well. So maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll draft that up as well. Thank you, um, and stay in touch with me. I'll try to get some staff analysis of that and figure out the right way to do it. Thanks. Hey uh, Tom, this is Cheryl Gannon. I was Hi, wondering Tom. if there's more the council could do to try to help the really elderly over 75. They're not all in nursing homes. My mom is 88 and I'm scanning all the sites every morning, trying to find her an appointment for um, a vaccine. And I saw someone on Facebook today uh, mentioned it was like playing the Hunger Games yes. when, you're, when you're trying to get your parent vaccinated. My, my mother is in no way capable of getting on a computer and going from site to site, trying to figure it out. And I almost feel like maybe the county health department should just take the over 75s from all those lists and make one list and try to reach out to them and help them get appointments. Um, I think that's a great idea. It is like the Hunger Games. It's extremely frustrating. Um, I know how to reach you. So let me have Sarah Wolf on my staff reach out and help navigate the system for you. We're doing okay. it with a lot of constituents and try to get you as quickly as possible into the queue of the folks that could vaccinate. You said it was your mother? Yeah, so it's my mother and she lives yeah. in Leisure World, so she's not in a nursing home. But, you know, oh. I registered her for the different lists. And then like, so Holy Cross, for example, all that does is they tell you on Thursdays at four o'clock, get on and try to get one. And then everyone races to it. And it, so it's just, it's really hard. It's hard for me. It's impossible for my mother. It's crazy. I, I you, you raised two important things I'll address really quickly. One is the equity issues. There's so many of our residents that aren't computer you know, savvy and to expect them all to sign up is, is, a, is a failed in prospect. So I've, I've pushed for um, more outreach, uh, non-internet outreach, you know, door-to-door -door outreach and, and others to our tenants, our black and brown residents and, and seniors and others that aren't, because we, they're the priority to get signed up and we're not signing them up at the right rates. Instead, big surprise, those of us who have three or four laptops and, and know how to sign up and, and work the system are, are getting a, sort of ahead of the queue exactly. too much. Exactly. And are a disproportionate cohort of the number of people that are getting um, vaccinated. Right, so, exactly. Um, uh, so yeah, let, me, let me have, uh, Sarah's gonna reach out uh, to you about that. Thanks. Okay. Great, and uh, we, we can take other questions. Um, um, before I did so, I just wanted to recognize three officials that had joined us. Okay. Um, State Senator uh, Jeff Waldstriker, um, Council Member uh, Gabe, uh, or I'm sorry, Council Member Sydney Katz, and Council Vice President uh, Gabe Elbernos. Um, if uh, uh, any of you would like to uh, turn your camera on and, and say anything um, before we jump into uh, questions, uh, feel free. Well, if, if it's okay, I'm Sydney Katz. For those of you lucky enough not to know me, I actually was the president right before uh, Tom was president. Uh, he was my vice president. Uh, the year of 2020 was probably the worst year <laughs> that we've ever had in, in the world and, and certainly in Montgomery County as well. But I, uh, I was very comforted to have Tom as, as uh, the, the person who was standing next to me during uh, all of that. And uh, I just wanted to stop by and say, how fortunate Montgomery County is to have a fellow by the name of Tom Hucker involved. I, I can tell you that, that he is a person who, I, I think one of the best things about being on the Montgomery County Council, and I mean this sincerely, is that you get to meet people, you, you get to know people who you've known for a while, but you really get to know them. And I am very, very honored 
to know Tom Hucker. So thank you all for allowing me to say a few words. And, he, and I am very proud to call him my good friend. Thanks. Sydney, that's so sweet. I'm really grateful. Before you got on, I said really nice things about you, and you won't believe it, but it's recorded. So I'll, I'll, well, prove I'll it go to back you. and listen. Okay. I'll prove it to you. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot and all your guidance and advice. Um, I really learned a lot last year working under you as your vice president. Dave, who's next? Mr. Uh, Tom Dale. Yeah, I must have been in the upper left corner. Sure. Hi, Tom. Hey, Tom. So, uh, Tom, uh, thank you for your leadership. This is a, an agenda I'm sure you, you didn't envision when you were thinking about uh, moving into this role. And Mr. Katz, uh, Councilmember Katz, thank you for your, your work last year. Greatly appreciate that. Um, but, Tom, I was glad that uh, you, you did get into the energy agenda. I know that's you know, not, not front and center, but an important one, and uh, we're grateful to be able to support you in that. I also just want to sort of, you know, put out there a thank you to, to Senator Van Hollen and I know Ms. Gross is still on the line. Uh, you know, it takes it takes resources to, to support the agenda that you all at the County Council have set of this 2035 at 0%. And, you know, the, the Senator has endorsed a, a bill that's, you know, for a National Climate Bank that could bring significant resources. And uh, we here could be, could be a benefit to that that could help, uh, Tom, you support that agenda that you guys are all pushing forward. And so, I just wanted to sort of compliment the senator and um, know, know we stand here in support of your agenda uh, in that regard. And we're, we're grateful and hopeful for those other resources to help uh, help achieve it. So just wanted to pull that out there, but thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody that doesn't know Tom, Tom's the director of our Green Bank, the Montgomery County Green Bank, which is a national model. And they're trying to start something uh, like it in Annapolis because it's been so successful in Montgomery County. Yeah. So, so let me recognize uh, council vice president, uh, Gabe Albernoz next. Um, thanks. I'll be brief because I know there's a lot of important questions, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity. So I think we're eight weeks in and serving as current president and vice president of the council. And um, obviously everyone's familiar with Tom's unbelievable, just really understanding of policy. Uh, and he's brilliant when it comes to addressing very complex issues and explaining them in a way that makes sense to all of us. And of course, his progressive values shine through in everything he does. Um, but the thing I have found most impressive is uh, coordinating uh, a lot of type A personalities can be pretty challenging. And uh, Tom does a terrific job of ensuring that all of our voices are heard and that he builds coalitions to be able to advance the policies that we all believe in so strongly. And as everyone has said, uh, he's drawn the, the short straw this year uh, being president during an unprecedented time, uh, but we appreciate his leadership and I wanna thank you, Tom, for all you do for our community. And it's an honor serving with you on this council and as your vice president. Gabe, likewise, thank you so much for your support, brother. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be in the leadership team with you. You've been such a great partner and I've learned so much from you. And if you don't know, Gabe's not only our council vice president, he's the chair of our HHS committee and there's nobody in the country better to le lead that committee at this time when all of our focus is on our health system than, than Gabe because the experience that he brings um, after working in the executive branch as a director there has been just invaluable as well as his understanding of our very complicated health system. Gabe, thanks so much for joining us and for your support. Really appreciate it. Our uh, next question uh, will be from uh, uh, Tony and then uh, Vicki and Barry, just so you all know the cue. Tony? Yeah, so uh, Tom, I'd like to ask what you see the next steps from the council in terms of the governor's plans uh, to widen the beltway in 270. That is a great, Question, Tony. Um, thanks for your hard work uh, to stop the very unwise widening of the Beltway and 270. Um, as you know, the governor's been on a mission to get this done. Um, he has really run roughshod over any sort of transparent uh, process. They've held numerous quote unquote town hall meetings where they didn't really take any feedback. They just presented a bunch of slide decks to people and told them this is how it's going to be. Um, you and I helped organize these rallies in Silver Spring in a town hall that brought out a thousand people to express their concerns. And uh, we've continued to stay really active. Um, they just rushed forward their preferred alternative. They uh, released details about it the, day, the night before Christmas Eve. Um, and then they rushed out their, their single preferred alternative uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, and they're gonna be bringing it to the Board of Public Works soon. It's really important for all of us to keep 
um, in touch with not just Treasurer Nancy Kopp, who's been fantastic on this issue, but Comptroller Peter Francho, because they're two thirds of the Board of Public Works, the third member is the governor, and um, no plan can pass with the, no alternative can pass without the support of the Board of Public Works. So uh, Comptroller Francho is really the swing vote here, and he has said he's not gonna let anything move forward without the support of Montgomery County and Prince George's County. So we need to really be clear with him what we want. And Tony, I can tell you the Transportation Secretary of uh, Maryland, uh, reached out to me yesterday and wanted to set up a meeting to uh, uh, get some feedback about how they could make their plan better um, and how they could uh, improve it by doing long sought improvements to the American Legion Bridge and the western portion of the Beltway without, um, which, which doesn't have the same environmental and um, housing impacts as, you know, the area of the Beltway going through Silver Spring from from uh, 270 to 95. And uh, he said in the email that he wants to do uh, what we need to ensure that those other parts are on the back burner and delayed. Um, so that they can move, if anything moves ahead, it's the part that is less objectionable. So um, I look forward to your feedback uh, and so many of our partners as we sit down with Greg Slater, the transportation secretary, but I'd urge everybody to stay in touch with uh, Comptroller Francho. Thank you for your leadership on this. You bet. Thank you. Likewise. Our next question is from uh, Vicki. Hello. Good evening, everyone. And hi, Tom. And hey, it's so great to see you. Thank hey, you. How so are you? Much. I'm fine. How are you? Good. Thanks. Thanks so much for all your wonderful work on everything. And um, I'm happy to be here. My question goes back to the vaccine. And um, many people on the um, Zoom know that I'm an educator. And as Jeff Wallstriker, just um, one of my former students, just sent me an, uh, a text through the chat telling me that his homework was going to be late. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I do want to ask about the vaccine for educators. I have had one shot um, and I thought the process was smooth for me, but um, I know a lot of teachers who haven't gotten an email um, telling them how to even arrange a shot. And educators were told that personnel, school personnel would um, be vaccinated before we had a return to school. Right. And then the return to school date um, did change, but we really haven't gotten a clear sense of how those vaccines are go going to get into teachers' arms, educators' arms before that return to school date. And Senator Van Hollen did talk about that coordination effort. So I'm just wondering what more can be done to ensure that there is that proper coordination, getting educators vaccinated so that we can have people feel comfortable and safe when we do return to school as we all want to do as soon as possible, but we want to do so safely. So right. I'm just wondering what type of work is happening on that front and and thank you again for your time and taking my question. Uh, no, Vicki, thank you for your service. It's a great question. I wish I had a better answer. Did you get vaccinated at, uh, at Suburban Hospital in, in the Johns Hopkins system? Um, through Johns Hopkins and I went out to the physics lab in Laurel um, okay. at Johns Hopkins. And again, it was a very efficient system, um, but I didn't even know they had sent me an email because somehow they sent it to my private email. And when everybody else was getting notified, I was like, why am I not getting a notice? Mm -hmm. And I happened to find it not in my MCPS email, but in my private email. And again, I don't know how that happened, mm -hmm. but um, so, but when I went out there, it was very efficient, very smooth. And they made my second appointment right after I had the shot. Good. So, um, I thought once it happened, it worked well. Okay. It's just that I know many educators haven't even gotten that notice and opportunity. And yet, you know, we're about a month away from a return to school. Right, right. I know um, the, the, the rules around and the schedule of school reopening is still under discussion, right? There's a draft plan and, and MCPS is is, is debating that in real time. The plan is to open it in stages and to start with, 
are you know uh, special needs kids that have the hardest time learning in this virtual environment um, and vocational training as well, where you really need to be in the school to use the tools and everything, um, and then stage it from there. Um, so much is dependent on the number of vaccines we get from the state and the state gets from the feds. Um, and as I mentioned, we we don't even get, not only do we not get enough vaccines, we don't even get any notice. They tell us on Sunday night, usually, how many doses we're going to get on Tuesday. So that makes it, I mean, you all know logistics. It's pretty hard to line up the clinics you need and the, fill the slots with vaccinators that are trained and licensed and everything if you don't even know how many people, how many doses you're going to get. Um, but that's, that's the crazy reality. We've now met with the governor. Uh, we went through a whole period during this pandemic where the governor hadn't talked to not only our county executive, but any of the big county executives for seven months or so during a pandemic. I've complained about that a lot publicly. And the governor recently had a phone call and then even a live meeting in person with, uh, with Mark. So that's good news. And it's also good news that in response to our criticism, I think um, they uh, increased the doses to hospitals and the hospitals came forward and took responsibility for vaccinating different cohorts of our population. The best example is the Johns Hopkins system is gonna vaccinate now Montgomery County school teachers um, like Vicki. Um, but the rules are still pretty murky. Uh, we're trying to also get uh, childcare workers um, prioritized as well because they're right on the front lines dealing with kids just at a different age. Um, and many other um, frontline workers that are not not high in the queue at, at 1B and 1C. So, um, Vicki, if, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to follow up with you and work with Hopkins and MCPS to try to get them answered. But that's the best I know. I'm glad you had a good, good um, experience the first round, and we have to get you the second one as quickly as possible. And if you send uh, your email address to us, um, Genevieve Kurtz on our staff um, can follow up with some some more information. Uh, the next question uh, will be from uh, Barry. Um, Barry? Hi, Barry. Yeah. Hi, hey, Tom. Um, good evening, and, and thanks uh, for all your support in, in East County, in particular with the BRT that you just mentioned. Um, so we had a call today uh, with Lorg about uh, pedestrian safety. We've had a few fatalities on our state highways um, right near in White Oak. And one of them is right, one of the intersections that, that needs a, a pedestrian crosswalk is right by where the new BRT stop is uh, at Stewart Lane. And we've had a fatality just up the road at Tech Road and one just recently on New Hampshire Avenue. So we asked Borg if she could um, somehow earmark funding <clears throat> for, um, for a crosswalk and she explained that that's just not how it works in Maryland. No. But we all also discussed the fact that the BRT was funded with Tiger money. Yeah. And here's a, a crosswalk that's needed to facilitate uh, the use of the BRT. So we wanted your support in helping us explore whether or not um, the Tiger money that was obtained for the BRT for 29 could be used for a purpose like that. Um, I, I'm happy to find that out. I mean, I, I bet, Barry, it's safe to assume you don't care who pays for it. Uh, you just want to get it done. Um, and so right. let me, let me A, if it's not done by the time I meet with the secretary, I'll bring it up with him. Um, it's on a state highway. You know, it's just a crosswalk. We might be able to get the county to pay for it and just get the state's permission to install it on there right away. Stewart Lane is a huge problem. We had a fatality there a year or two ago. Um, right. So hard to cross under the best of circumstances, much less in the dark in the winter, um, and with more people drawn to the BRT now. So um, I'll do everything I can to get that done, and work with Lord. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. You bet. Great. Uh, next, I wanted to recognize um, State Senator uh, Jeff Waltzreicher, who is a Vice Chair of the Senate's uh, Judicial Proceedings Committee, uh, who asked just to bring uh, uh, some brief greetings. Jeff. Well, thank you, Dave. It's uh, so wonderful to see everyone. Uh, so wonderful to see so many friendly faces. Um, you know, Tom is a double threat, uh, which is why he's such an effective legislator. Tom worked in Annapolis as a delegate for many years, as you know, representing the good folks of District 20 and is now serving on the council and doing so incredibly ably. And so when we need a bridge between Rockville and Annapolis, Tom is that bridge. Um, and understands the inner workings of how Annapolis works and brings that expertise to his colleagues in Rockville. 
And uh, so Tom does so much uh, amazing work in our community. And now you know why, because he is the liaison and making sure that our state is being responsive to our county's needs. And that of course includes the vaccines. Tom has done a great job pressuring the Hogan administration and making sure everyone uh, stays accountable when it comes to bringing vaccines to Montgomery County, uh, not only the doses, but also making sure the logistics are working effectively, which to date they are not. Um, and we're working with Tom to get those improvements. So uh, Tom is a, a great legislator, a great council member, a great person. Um, and I'm so proud to support him. And thank you to everyone on this call for doing the same. Oh. Senator, thank you so much. I really appreciate all your kind words. Um, stay on so I can say a minute about you. Uh, you know, So if you don't know, uh, some of you maybe not from District 18, you should know the powerful vice chair of the Judiciary Committee um, in, the, on, in the Senate, a uh, longtime delegate who started at the same time as I did um, in District 18 and then, and then was elected Senator as well. Um, and is working with our Senator in District 20, Will Smith, the chair on this ambitious police reform agenda to uh, respond to the national call for racial justice and, and police reform, which um, in many ways is, is long overdue in Maryland. It's not an easy lift, but they, um, they have an awful lot on their plate. And I'll just tell you about Jeff, when I used to represent District 20 and I started to run in District 5, which also includes a lot of District 18, what everybody told me was just, if, if I'll, I'll vote for you if you're as good on constituent service as Jeff Waltzreicher is. So um, that's what uh, that's what's been my uh, my goal in life is to live up to that pressure in uh, District 18. So um, thanks so much for being here, Jeff. You're a good friend. I appreciate it. And keep up all the good work in Annapolis. Great. Our next speaker will be uh, Sissy. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hey, how are you? Hey, it's good to see you. Happy New Year. And thank you for everything you do. Um, so my question is about, uh, um, you know, um, I got a vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine in a Wyoming community center, which is just a month ago, and then I'm expected to get uh, uh, on this coming to Monday. And, but the question is about uh, um, how would like general people like kids or other usually like people who works for a different job, not just like essential worker or the healthcare workers, just like if you had the parents like work in the office or teleworking and, and especially for kids like who want to go back to school safely, like for example, I have a brother who's a freshman at uh, uh, Montgomery Blair High School and uh, we were supposed to know when the kids should be able to turn to school or, or wherever kids need to get some like vaccinated to make sure they were heading back to school safer. So this is what's just a concern I was having to do with you. So I appreciate for everything you did, Tom. Yeah, without knowing, I guess more specifics, it's kind of hard to respond. But if you, if you, I mean, I know how to reach you. If you don't mind, we'll follow up with, I, I uh, Sarah and I can follow up with you and try and try and get that addressed. Dave, do you have any additional suggestions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, probably not is because uh, yeah, I just want to, yeah, because uh, it's, it's usually we want to know how would general people be able to get uh, um, COVID-19 that vaccine like across statewide and count, and count probably across Montgomery County and it, it's a, it's a, it just depends on where they are, how old they are and where they are, what, doc, what their occupation is, where they are in the, the priority queue, but um, we'll I'm happy to work with you on that individual case as we are with so many people to try to get them in the queue, you know, and vaccinated as quickly as possible. Yeah, 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 just quickly, yeah, just quickly as possible because we were supposed to know when, when the what will people, general people can able to get, uh, um, able to get the, um, the vaccinated. That's the biggest concern that my family and I have been asking questions because I fully understand that um, Maryland is, relatively slow about the COVID-19 vaccine. So that's why. So I appreciate the question. I, I apologize uh, for the other question I have to ask. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Good to see you. We'll follow up. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Phil. Uh, hey, Tom. Hey, Phil. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, so congratulations being the uh, council president. I'm sorry we lost you, at least for our parochial purposes here in, in our little Silver Spring district. 
but you, you broaden your horizons. I still got that job too. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, and I, yeah, I think you have my nicer charger. I, I wanted, I'm sorry, I'm a okay, we got a little broken up there. Tom, I just wanted to thank you for among the other things that you've done is just your availability and your responsiveness makes it so much more inviting for someone like me to get involved in the political process. So you should just know that there's a real impact that you've had on me and I suspect a lot of people who think, well, I, I could call Tom, which is not a given when you're dealing with someone who's in the political world. And so I just want to acknowledge you for, for bringing that forth. Now, my, my, my particular issue, Tom, and, and I know it's close to your heart too, is these restaurants in Silver Spring, which I'm very involved in professionally, mm -hmm and personally, and I've just seen them getting just crushed in the pandemic and other problems that they've been having. And I noticed on your uh, first, um, your first, one of your first bullet points on your, your, your first slide was restaurants and the assistance yeah. that restaurants are going to be getting. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the plan is for restaurants and particularly for Silver Spring restaurants, if there's anything that you can do for them, uh, the council can do for them at this point in time. Sure. Um, well, there, uh, as much as I'm very loyal to Silver Spring restaurants, there's, they're in the same legal posture across the county. Um, you know, they're, they're open for outdoor, uh, for, they're open for delivery uh, service, but not indoor dining at this point. Um, and that's obviously due to the, the, uh, the, back, the virus numbers that we, we've seen. Um, there is a lot of concern out there. We've lost way too many, let me say two things. We've lost way too many restaurants and small businesses in my view, completely unnecessarily, their collateral damage. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there's a billion and a half dollars sitting in the state's funds that ought to go to um, these restaurants to keep them afloat. It's not only humane, it's just fiscally the right thing to do to keep those businesses afloat and then keep those jobs in place. And the state will benefit by getting the corporate income tax, the individual income tax. Once they reopen six months from now, we can see that light at the end of the tunnel, but we just have to get there. Um, uh, we have in Montgomery County, um, we've, we've passed 30 special appropriations for $255 million, $76 million of which went to um, small businesses and restaurants, over $22 million to restaurants. There was just a new $4.9 million we passed two weeks ago. If you look on my Facebook page, there's a link that your clients can go to to apply for $10,000 grants um, to try to keep them afloat. They're all struggling. I'm in touch with a lot of them. And if you even look in the, I tagged a whole lot of folks you know um, in the, in, to make sure that they saw my post and apply for that money. Cause I, I don't want it sitting in the account. I, and I'd rather go to Silver Spring than Darnstown restaurants. Um, I hope they all, they all apply. Um, uh, you know, no restaurant owner ought to be forced into this false choice of, do I, do I feel like I have to reopen in a really unsafe environment, get sick myself or get my, my uh, my workers sick, or do I have to um, close and lose my investment um, in my life savings and go out of business? They, they, many of them have gotten grants from the county. We've had three different generations of these county grants, but they haven't gotten nearly enough help from the feds or especially the state. The state has been really asleep at the switch and it's been very uneven. I picked up Chinese food in Wheaton a couple of weeks ago and I walk in and they said, oh my gosh, Councilmember Hucker, we're so glad to see you. We've gotten three grants from the county and we'd be out of business if we hadn't, but they hadn't gotten anything from the state or the feds. Um, and there's there's way too many. Walk around downtown Silver Spring, you see all the boarded up you know, businesses um, that have gone under and they unnecessarily. So you know, I'm fighting to get more money from the state and I'm trying to get the money on the street. So get your clients to apply, please. And we're happy to to navigate that for you. Great. I'll talk to them about it. Thanks, Tom. And, and we're we're going to reopen pretty soon. Um, the county execs already giving us an executive order. It's being debated with by my colleagues. It might be a week or two away. Great. The uh, next question is uh, Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hello, neighbor. Um, you yelled from my house to, to your house. I to know. <laughs> we'll have to meet out in the middle, like we were doing when it was warmer. Amy says hi too. Oh, good. <laughs> so the, the first thing is I have a little rant I want to start with, and I promise it's little, but um, we've heard it from the president. We've heard it from a lot of other people. It has to do with the white supremacists. It has to do with a lot of the QAnon and other related groups and the domestic terrorism. And the response we get is that isn't who we are. 
my complaint is that is who we are. It's not who all of us are and it isn't who we have to be. So my pitch is to please start acknowledging that is part of who we are in this country. Because if we're going to address racism, if we're going to address the, all of the isms that are tearing us apart, we have to start by admitting that is part of who we are. Okay, that's my soapbox. I'll get off of that now. So I have a question about the census. How did we do in the county and how did we do statewide in terms of the counts and making sure that everybody possible got counted? Well, Dave might want to help me out here. What I've what I've seen is incomplete. We had a briefing at the council level. Um, we put a lot of effort with partners like uh, AARP and um, Common Cause and county staff uh, headed up by Diane Vu, who was the head of our office community partnerships. And we had multilingual staff and nonprofit contractors all across the county for months. And their report back of how many people they got to was record participation. Um, very difficult in Montgomery County. We got people, as you know, from 150 countries and they speak 170 languages. Um, so that requires an awful lot of cultural competency to reach them all, but um, it wasn't perfect. I'm sure there were a lot of holes um, that we're gonna hear about, but the presentation I heard was very positive. What we don't have yet is the data back from the federal government. So we're all looking forward to, to that as we redraw draw districts and other things like that. But everything I've seen is I've been pretty pleased with. Yeah, well, the number is so important for so many things from the redistricting to funding for all sorts of things. So yeah, that was that was where I was concerned. Thank and you, I have, um, Anna, our, just to add on to that, our last update from the uh, Maryland Department of Planning Secretary, um, Rob McCord, was that um, we should expect that data back um, uh, around July 31st. Um, so it still, still will be a while um, just for that context. Okay. Okay. And then I just have one more quick comment, uh, and that has to do back to the whole idea the question earlier about what's going to happen on the or where are we going in terms of the proposals that the governor has for widening 270 and 495 is Mark's idea about starting with the bridge American Legion bridge and then doing reversible lanes so we're not widening and we're not taking any land on the outside but rather turning the center and rebuilding all of our bridges, is that getting any traction in the county? Um, in the, well, or do you mean with the state? Yeah, well, the, state, the state's right. open to that. That's, that's phase one as they've drawn it up. And the beltway from 270 from the spur to 95 that we don't want widened, um, especially, um, that's phase two. And I'm hoping that it's phase nowhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, they've 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 adjusted their proposal to really start with the bridge where there's already reversible lanes coming in from Virginia, of course. The bridge has been in our priorities list for a long time. Um, the secretary in his email to me um, said that he wants to talk to me about pedestrian improvements on the bridge, um, bike improvements, um, <laughs> other things to facilitate transit. Um, they want to they want to let bus rapid transit and other transit use the reversible lanes, you know, toll free, etc. Um, so there's the bridge needs fixing, and there's things they could do to make it greener and better for everybody and to encourage transit. Um, it's very important uh, to everybody on the western side of the county near the belt near 270 to try to stay, as you said, within the, the walls, not just even the right of way, but the walls. Um, so it's not expanded and to more efficiently use the pavement we already have and paid for with reversible lanes rather than widening it and adding, adding four lanes, um, you know, just doesn't, doesn't make any sense, obviously. And the strange thing is, of course, where you really have the congestion is north of 370, on 270, is the northern part north of 370, where it gets narrower all the way to Frederick. And the poor folks that live up there, they hit huge traffic as soon as they pass 370 going home and they hit it on the, on the way in as well at that point. Um, but they aren't addressing that first, they're addressing the part of 270 that's already 12 lanes wide. Why? Because they have to make enough money for the toll operators to pay for phase two. Um, and they've said that, you know, this is the kind of perverse incentives that you get when you have a P3 it's not about relieving congestion. You have this second goal that you have to serve as well of raising enough revenue to pay for the whole project in real time. It's not all financed. So it's, 
um, that 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 messes up the priorities. But um, we're going to continue to push. And thanks for your your advocacy. Thanks. Great. Uh, next, uh, we have a question from Fran. Hi, Tom. Hey, thanks for doing. Hi, Tom. Thanks for for doing this and for everything else you do. Um, you probably know that I was a PTA president at Blair for a number of years. When I was there, the school resource officer or the, the in-school police officer was fabulous. We all liked him. Phil Gaines liked him. It was all great. Um, 20, all, uh, 23 of your high school principals, I guess all of your high, the high school principals are in favor of keeping SROs. However, if you look at the data, which you will see tonight in your hearing, that right. it begins at 7.30, yep. um, it is, Black children, particularly black boys, who are hugely disproportionately arrested and right. started on the school to prison pipeline as a direct result of having SROs in the school. Um, I am begging you, please encourage people to look at the data and decide based on the data. Um, the the um, social the racial equity and social justice impact statement that's attached to what you're going to be looking at tonight says very clearly um, that it's black boys who are most affected right. hugely disproportionately. Um, and one of the things we all want to do, I think, is remedy the systemic racism in all of our systems. By getting SROs out of the schools, you will be remedying a long time um, inequity. And I just wanted to hear any thoughts you had on that. Thanks. Um, thanks, Fran. And by the way, I should add, the Women's Democratic Club is big time out in force on this. So you will hear from us in testimony tonight. Good. I can't wait. Jill Ortman Faust bet. is on here too with us. She knows a little <laughs> bit about this. Um, the Honorable Jill Ortman Faust, who's uh, nice enough to work for me part-time. So um, yeah, as you know, Fran, thank you for your advocacy on that. Um, I voted twice in the last year to um, to, to uh, um, uh, stop the funding from SROs. I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. Everybody wants to keep our kids safe in the schools. I think there's other ways to do it. We're all required to have a safety plan under the state law. Um, the county exec is coming up, uh, as he's told me, with an alternative where you know we keep we already have security in the schools. Um, SROs are on top of that. Schools are different. There's 23 high schools. They're quite different. Um, and there's 24 counties in Maryland, and they are all under the state law, the same state law, but they approach this issue differently. Um, and so, you know, I think we want to work in conjunction with the principals and MCPS to have a good safety plan for every school that has a, an officer close by in the event something bad happens, but not right in the schools, um, causing the problems that are associated with SROs. So, um, and if you get, if this is an opportunity to get more cops out in the community on the beat near schools, um, you know, that's, that's a good opportunity too, because we don't have enough community policing like that. Well, there might also be an opportunity to take some of that money and invest it in school counselors, right. yeah. psychiatrists, psychologists, Absolutely. so that the, the root problems are addressed. There's a huge need for that. Some of the money initially came from the state and could only be used for the police, but yes, yeah. absolutely. I favor a lot more money for counselors and, um, and uh, behavioral health specialists dealing with, and then we wouldn't need as many cops on the back end. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I am going to uh, take two comments related to the Beltway since we were just talking about that, and then we'll get back to the question queue. Uh, we are, uh, thank you everyone for your patience. We are trying to get to everybody. Um, so um, Barb and then uh, Tom on the Beltway, and then we'll get back to questions with uh, the next question from Devon. Barb? Okay, thanks very much. Um, hi, Tom, how are you? Um, so as you know, I'm active in Citizens Against Beltway Expansion, and we love working with Dave and the rest of your staff uh, in, in uh, fighting the governor's efforts to add private toll lanes. I wanted to um, re reiterate or pile on to your comments about the role that Peter Franchot plays in this process. Uh, the governor is trying to short circuit the federal environmental uh, review process by get, getting giving the Board of Public Works a contract, a first contract, probably in April to vote on, even though we won't have a final environmental 
uh, impact statement until next fall. And this is totally contrary to the way the federal law is supposed to work on, on these things. So uh, specifically, I would urge people to contact uh, the comptroller and to urge him to reject the first contract that the governor submits, um, especially because the uh, federal environmental impact statement is not yet. <laughs> so thank you for letting me. Barbara, Sally, uh, you all know Citizens Against Beltway Expansion with Tony. Thank you for all your hard work and advocacy on this, keeping us safe and protecting our environment and, and, uh, and, a, and a transparent process. Really appreciate it. And uh, Tom, your comment? Yeah, so Tom, this, this, more on a personal front, we, we live right near where the likely expansion will go, right, on the, on the, on the, the part up to 270. And um, our community, I, what Barbara was just saying, we're certainly, you know, our community has been in that voice of, you know, just is this necessary and stuff. But just if you have, you know, if it does go forward, I think some of the things we're seeing is the, the interchange of River Road is just uh, huge and, and could be hugely disruptive. So. You know, if there's a, a point of, you know, that, that that's a stress on the community as well as uh, in the past, you know, our community has been promised walls and then pulled back. And so that's a big c concern on our community, too, that, you know, if this does go forward, that the promises are met. So I just put that out there as, uh, but, you know, our, our community has been vocal on this, but I uh, thought I would you know, sort of throw those things out there as long as this conversation touched on the Beltway. Thanks, Tom. What's the name of your civic association or your neighborhood? Uh, yeah, Carter Rock Springs. Oh, you're in Carter Rock Springs. Yep. Yep. Which is a historic community. And, you know, we, we get to participate because of that as well. Yeah. Thanks for coming to our rally. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Devon. Yeah. Tom, Devon. thank you so much uh, for everything you do, especially during these trying times. And I also want to thank you for accessibility. You and uh, your staffers like Dave have done an excellent job. So thank you, Dave and Tom. Thank you. Um, I got a very basic question, this 1A, 1B, 1C. Who defines that? Is that the federal government, state, or the county? And the reason I ask that is, you know, I chair Interfaith Works, where um, our congregate care, our workers are essential workers, but that's only half our staff. The other half are not part of the essential workers, and they can't get the vaccines. But we have, they interact with one another, and we had to situation in January where we had to close down our clothing center because the staff got vaccine, got the COVID uh, virus. And we almost had to close down our food distribution for that wow. week, which we're providing very essential services for probably the most needy. This past week, we had 500, about 500 families come for a food distribution. Wow. So um, how does that get defined? And can we, you know, that if we could get into one C for the other, staffers, is that possible? Um, I th I'm, I'm the wrong one to ask in terms of expertise. My understanding is the, the uh, criteria, there may be others who can chime in here, but the, the, the criteria come from the CDC and then the local health officers and the state both have an, a limited ability to sort of tweak it um, mm -hmm. based on local needs. But um, why don't we work with you individually to try to see where we could, where okay. we could make sure that your staff are in the right priority in in the queue. Um, I reach out to Dave, Dave help with that. Yeah. Our, that Dave, I'll reach out to you tomorrow. That's okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. I'll actually connect you with our staffer um, on this uh, via text right now. So okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Dave. Thanks, Tabong. Thanks for all your help. Thank you. Our next um, question is from Tababu. Tababu, good to see you. Hey, Tababu. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, my question is about uh, I'm, I'm planning to travel to Ethiopia for six to seven weeks to finally. Uh, having the farmer sign the investment partnership we worked for for the last 15 years, literally. Uh, they're coming uh, uh, to sign. Oh, by the way, thank you, Phil. I see you there. Phil has been a strong supporter of mine on that project. And while I'm thanking people, Fran, amazing job with behind you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for the, the activism and advocacy. You make our community vibrant. That said, I'd like to thank you, Tom, for what you've done to pass the bill for that mobile uh, crisis. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I invited you to come speak at the Panan's protest. Okay. Panan was cut down. Panan was a young 20 years old boy who, who had a mental issue outside his house with a knife and a, a Montgomery police arrived, you know, Panan charged, he shot him down with seven bullets where the community was very upset. Came, uh, Tom, you came, spoke at uh, 
Blair High School protest and you promised to do something about it. And in July 21st, you were able to spearhead that special appropriation for the mobile crisis response. And that's a very good step in the right direction. And you mentioned Emmanuel San Fernand's name. Thank you, that means a lot to us. And I would like, I would like to see a continued leadership. By the way, Dave, thank you. Dave is also an amazing public servant behind you. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to your continued leadership to support our initiative to help our immigrant slash community micro businesses survive this COVID thing. We're working with community leaders to develop a strategy we call a strive, adjust, and thrive. Uh, I've mentioned it to you a while back. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to continued service. That said, I'm traveling and it's gonna be five to six weeks. Uh, the president is gonna host the Benefit Cooperation for Africa Forum where the farmers are going to, to come and sign. I'm gonna have a lot of meetings. And, and uh, so I'm concerned. I'm wondering if there is any any consideration for people who will be traveling abroad for vital important work to minimize the risk and uh, what is that I can do uh, to get that consideration? My wife is actually saying, you can't live without, I know it's been a long time, it's important, but uh, we have to get, we have to wait till you get the vaccine before you go. And I've worked on this thing for the last 15 years and I wanna take advantage of it. So right. I don't know what uh, uh, can be done. Thank you. Let, let me, Tababu, thank you for all your kind words. Uh, to probably even, I think, delayed his flight to Ethiopia to be yeah, here tonight. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks for uh, inconveniencing yourself. Yeah, yeah. Let me find out what, I don't know the answer. I haven't ever seen very much about travelers and where they are in the queue, and if there's any individual exceptions like that. Um, but let, let us find out. This is not only a complicated situation, it's one that changes every, every week or two. Um, okay. And absolutely, he also, I didn't mention the good news. Um, in response to, well, we had you know two police shootings in Montgomery County a um, year or two ago, and in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the murder of George Floyd, one of the things I did was put in a special appropriation supported by all my colleagues to set aside $600,000 to hire six social workers to expand our mobile crisis units so we could have mobile behavioral health specialists partnered up probably with EMTs to get quickly to the scene of any individuals in crisis so we could deal with them um, uh, immediately with a behavioral health expert and not just with a police officer. Um, okay. And uh, it's taken a while, but just this week we were notified they've hired five out of the six and they're gonna be on the street uh, very soon and stationed around the county in different locations so they can get quickly to all parts of the county. So I'm staying involved with that to Babu, but thank you for your advocacy and your good words. And. Um, Thank you, thank you. You know, Blazed Coffee is gonna be signed as the first prototype of the Benefit Cooperation for Africa initiative that aspires to redefine US-Africa trade relation vis-a-vis -vis the leadership of the African immigrant community. It's becoming big. I'll send a package to Thanks. your office to I'm very, very, I'm very proud of myself and my community. And once again, Phil Zillip, deep and thank you, thank you. You've done an amazing job to help us to get to that point. Thank you. Babu, I, I tagged you on Facebook with the Amharic video you about vaccination you can share with all your friends. Wonderful. I'll do that. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, buddy. Hi, thank you. Uh, I see being near the end means I need to be very brief, which is not my usual style. I have long answers. I apologize. <laughs> no. uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm asking because I have my role as co-chair of Emergency Preparedness Committee in Tacoma Park. One of the things, and most of this has to do, this has to do with primarily the vaccine and one other item, question revaccine. What's been coming up a lot is there are all these lists to sign up to. Is there any plan to pull it all together? There's the list from the county. Then you can sign up for hospitals, but then within that, there are several different hospitals. Then you can sign up for grocery stores of which there are several different ones. And now there are gonna be pharmacies. It's making people crazy. Is there any, so the first question is, is there any plan or any way to use technology to pull it all into one system so that, and it's been particularly coming from people who are right either on the edge or 75 and over or have some other requirement. Any plan to pull this together so people don't have to sign up for all that? 
Um, I hope so. Um, uh, you could, you could uh, guess I've gotten this question a lot and all my colleagues have. Um, unfortunately, this overlapping and overly complicated system um, is all cooked up by the state, okay? And if you watch Larry Hogan's State of the State address last night, and there's some logic to it, he's like, we need to get vaccines out there as, po as quickly as possible. And um, so we need the right mix of public and private providers. Um, and, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, essentially. Um, so we have vaccines, as you said, retail pharmacies, re retail grocers, hospitals, nursing homes, and county health clinics. You've heard me argue we should get more in the county health clinics. We're extremely um, efficient. We are, have a huge backlog and waiting list. We have a huge number of people who qualify for 1A in Montgomery County. We have 64,000, I think it is, people in 1A just between people who are 75 and up and healthcare providers that are on the front lines. Because we have we have so many nursing homes, six hospitals, whatever. The we, it's hard. Um, we, that, it was very confusing for people when the governor standing up at a press conference saying, okay, now the state's all magically in 1C when we, not only we're still working through 1A, the reason we're working through 1A is he hasn't given us the doses to get to everybody in 1A yet. Right. So it's very frustrating and confusing to people. Um, uh, my understanding is A, we're, I mean, we're doing the best we can with like limited resource, the county uh, uh, site and my own email newsletters. If you look, the last one we sent out has links. So you can go to one our, my one newsletter and here's how to sign up at Giant. Here's how to sign up with the county. Here's how to sign up with a hospital, anybody. It's all one-stop shopping at least. The state you know, has this confusing um, prep mod system that was not designed for COVID. It was designed for the flu. And so it is very difficult, to, but, but the governor has promised to improve it. And my understanding is I think there will be a, a, more, um, a more sort of aligned one-stop system with, 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 used as a portal to have links to all the providers when they make that upgrade. Okay, so that, that goes to a question that um, people who are very elderly and don't know how to do this. The question is, what is the accessibility opportunities? If you don't, obviously, if you don't have a computer, that's a, I'll get to that in a sec about the wonderful process where you were le lending of hotspots. But before that, how are we helping people who can't see very well or don't know how to use the computers or can't hear? I mean, I know Maryland finally got text 911, finally. Yeah. Yeah. But what about this stuff? How, what ways are there for those with disabilities or very elderly and don't have this to, to get any of this information, let alone get the vaccine? Is, is there some place I can it, contact, it, look it up? It depends. I mean, the, the short answer is work through my office, right? Dave's here, okay. Jill's here, um, and we can try and point you in the right direction depending on who you're talking about. So if you're talking about like seniors at Victory Towers in Tacoma Park, we could probably work with our Office of Aging to have outreach going on there or with our rent, the Renters Alliance or other nonprofits. Most of our outreach, as you know, in a place as big and complicated as Montgomery County, some of it's done by county employees, but there's not enough of them and they're, you know, they're pulled in every direction, but it's done through um, ideally culturally competent nonprofit providers. Uh, you mentioned all the barriers like um, internet access and, and age, but also language access is a huge right. problem. So we're, you know, we're, we're trying to stand up these, we have hubs and we have a nonprofit uh, partners that are doing outreach. There's not enough of it. I wanna, you know, I wanna have more of it done. My colleagues, have, we've spent more on this than any other county in the state. And that's one reason we need more funding from the state and the feds to, to make it happen because without that in intentionality, um, you get the inequities that you've seen uh, Washington Post write about that we're getting, you know, disproportionately middle-class, disproportionately uh, uh, wealthy, disproportionately white folks signed up because they have help, they have their comfortable right. computer, whatever. Well, if I get in touch with your office, yeah, do that. I'll get that info. And yeah. I write a monthly column, so I will be in touch Please. with my columns too. We'll get you the and best information. Are there gonna be any more, just quick, and if the answer is I don't know, that's fine. Any more of these hot spots that the library is giving out? We can follow up with that with the the libraries. Um, yeah, they have 
the of their announcement and that I um, I talked about on the radio program said 250. So if it's possible, and it's only for two weeks, and you can't renew it. So if it's possible to explore either getting more or doing something, that would be great. Yeah, great. I think it's a follow great up. program. We should expand. Thank it. you. I'll follow uh, up you. on the other. Next, I wanted to recognize um, a, a huge supporter of Tom's, the uh, uh, president of the Montgomery County Small Business Association, and the uh, most patient person here tonight because yes. I uh, I missed him much earlier. So uh, Ken O'Connell, the floor is yours. Hi, good evening, Tom. Thanks for being uh, here. Yeah, thank you. For, first, I want to thank you and your staff for having this. And, and also, I want to really thank uh, you and Council Member Katz for the tremendous support you've given the Montgomery County Small Business Association for a long time, pre-pandemic even. And also, uh, Council Member Navarro and, and Albert Oz have also been supportive as well. But um, Tom, I'm going to be brief. I want uh, to bring to you a message from the board from the Montgomery County Small Business Association. They would like you to consider uh, what we believe is a zero cost, high impact thing that Montgomery County government could do right now. And that is through some sort of either emergency legislation or directive or executive order, whatever it is, direct procurement to uh, send all of the procurement from Montgomery County government to Montgomery County small businesses or, and or Montgomery County businesses. Zero cost, high impact, should have thought about it a long time ago, but we would ask you to seriously consider that. I don't need to tell you that our small businesses are, are dying. It's not just restaurants, it's, it's all our service businesses. Montgomery County continues to procure services and products. Um, and I think that would be something that uh, I'm hoping you'll give some serious consideration to. And again, I wanna thank you for everything you've done and, and the council has done in the past, but please consider that. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Ken was a real leader in this um, um, local preference uh, bill that passed through the council recently where our local small businesses get more points when they're competing with out of county businesses for procurement contracts, which is a great thing helps us keep our your tax dollars here in Montgomery County creating jobs, so. Yeah, good uh, Thank you, and our, our last, um, I think our last question is from uh, Laura Stewart. Hey, Laura, how are you? Laura. I'm fine, hi. I promise make this super, super quick. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being one of the go-to people in this Montgomery County and in Maryland when it comes to supporting our kids in school. Um, really appreciate all the work you've done, even though you're not even on the education committee. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, and I know it's a hard question, but um, the capital budget is broken in my opinion. Um, do you have ideas on how to fix it? Uh, you gotta tell me more about how, what you mean, to, to, how it's broken. Um, so for several years, we don't meet our expectations um, for money coming in. And so there's constantly kind of a little side hunger games <laughs> yeah. for the funds that are there. And then, you know, then it's a fight between transportation and schools. And really part of it is just because we're not meeting our targets. And I know this year is especially, I mean, of course, it's difficult all around but it's a pattern that's happened over the last few years. And I wanna know if you have any ideas um, on how to fix this um, cycle we're in. That's a big question. Um, uh, you're right. I mean, at the, at the high level, you know, uh, as well as anybody on the call that we don't get nearly enough money from Annapolis, which has primary responsibility for building our schools. And we not only get, don't get our fair share given having the biggest enrollment in the state, um, we, um, uh, uh, we, we, we get less than, you know, a number of other jurisdictions. Uh, and this is not a one, one year thing. It's routine. Um, second, uh, I mean, in the last few years, to be honest, we did, you know, put a lot more money into school construction than previous years. Um, and it, it, as you know, takes a while to get those things built, but we've, we've caught up some, we just have this surging enrollment, unfortunately, um, which is the sort of thing a lot of counties would like to have um, because we have such a desirable school system. But, um, you know, and I think you and I have talked about this. Some of it is 
um, looking at using our limited resources more efficiently. We, we don't have enough schools um, and enough school um, uh, facilities, but then we also have a lot of empty commercial office buildings, for example. And there are changes that need to be done at the state level to allow more of our commercial office buildings that are sitting empty, in this case, they were struggling pre-COVID, now they're really struggling in many cases, to uh, be used for other purposes, like childcare facilities, which we don't have enough of, and like schools. There's interesting things that are being done in other jurisdictions um, to have like urban schools um, using commercial office buildings that in a dense area like Silver Spring, you know, people that live close by can, can walk to their school and, and, it's in, and it's in a classroom in a commercial office building that we're not really doing in Maryland. And that's gonna require some changes at the state level, but I'd, I'd love to see that as well. Um, and then there's, you know, there's been this trend toward bigger and more expensive schools significantly than we used to, we used to build 20 years ago. And, you know, that, that everybody likes the biggest, fanciest, nicest school, but it's hard to have, there's a trade-off with the number that you can build and the speed at which you can build them. What I leave out, Jill? What, one more little bit. Um, I, I know there's some unfinished business on the uh, growth policy and that's the recordation tax piece. So I'm hoping that we still get to that this year. Yep. Yeah, no, I think we will, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so um, we do need to wrap up um, because uh, as you heard earlier, um, the County Council um, has a, uh, a full public hearing. They'll be in until 9.30 or 10 tonight. Um, so I will turn it back over to Tom for um, just final thank you. Um, I did wanna recognize uh, Michael Solomon. I think uh, many of you may have received an email or a phone call even from. Um, so thank you, Michael, for all your help uh, with this event. And I also wanted to recognize um, uh, some members of the team who uh, joined on their personal time, um, uh, Jill and Genevieve and Julio, uh, really appreciate uh, you all being here. And I know um, they'll actually be doing much of the follow-up that uh, we were talking about. So uh, let me turn it back over to Tom uh, for final remarks. Yeah, th thanks to all the staff that helped out. I really appreciate it. And to everybody who volunteered. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I should let you go, but I'm really grateful for all your friendship and all your support. It means a lot to me that you're here. I know that you, you all have a lot going on too. Um, and, um, you know, this is this is a kind of competitive business. And I did, if I didn't have supporters, I wouldn't be able to, you know, get people to vote for my bills and to, um, to uh, support the shared priorities that we all have and the stuff we talked about tonight, whether it's support for our small businesses or, or keeping our, our public safe and vaccinated. Um, or getting, you know, getting the economy open safely. So, um, and, 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 you know, getting the, the, our right, the proper transportation policy. All those things are important. And, you know, I, I tell you, people really, it really matters. It's, it's not an accident that a lot of my colleagues wanted to jump in here and say hi to you all, because um, they know you're important and you're influential and you're behind me. And that means a whole lot. And that certainly helps, um, not just me get reelected, but it helps my influence, my ability to get stuff done in the county council. So thank you so much um, for sticking with me and uh, stay in close touch because, you know, all the, all the best legislation I think I've ever passed uh, came from ideas from many of you. So thank you, Tom. Thanks so much and stay in touch. Thank you. For all your support. Thank you.